Hello again, and welcome to another episode of British Murders. I am your host, Stuart Blues, and this is now the third episode of season three, 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 three. I've received some lovely feedback so far with regards to the slightly new style and format of the show. To reiterate, each episode is filmed and available to watch in full on the show's YouTube channel. I appreciate some people do still listen to this on an audio-only format, but I'm trying to keep it so it's listenable on the audio format, but also a little bit more engaging if you are to watch it on YouTube. Please let me know if you are still enjoying this on audio only. I would like to hear some feedback. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to my mate Robbie Robertson, who hosts Out of the Blank, which is a podcast which is just conversation. I've been on there a couple of times. I'm due to go on again soon. I'm wearing one of his excellent merch t-shirts now. If you can't see that because my mic is in the way, it's sort of, and for the benefit of the audio listeners as well, it kind of shows a koi carp in a kind of epic Pokemon-style death battle with kind of a fire-breathing bird of sorts. I don't think it's a phoenix, but it's a cool battle. It's cool artwork. Apparently, it was done by a tattoo artist. That's why it's so cool. I just thought I'd wear it for the show. Seeing as I film my episodes now, if anyone does want to send me a t-shirt to wear, whether it's for a podcast or a band or whatever you kind of do, please get in touch and we'll see if I can maybe feature your shirt on one of my episodes. Now then, as always, I'm going to first provide you with some history and facts about the area where the events of this episode's story takes place. The town in question is Northampton, which is in the East Midlands of England. Located roughly 70 miles north and slightly west of London, Northampton is famous for its historical shoemaking industry. The tradition of cobbling, by which I mean shoe repair, is something that modern day society isn't really in need of. Long gone are the days where you'd visit a traditional cobbler to have your best shoes repaired. Nowadays it's a case of throwing out the old pair and just buying a new pair online. I'm pretty sure that cobblers are still around in the UK, though I'd have no idea where to go if my shoes needed repairing if I ever felt the need to get them repaired by a cobbler. I wonder what the cost would be as well. If it's cheaper than buying a new pair, then let's get spending. Fun fact, Northampton Town FC, the town's local football club, are nicknamed the Cobblers. Shoe'd never have guessed that, would you? So bad. Anyway, bad puns aside, let's quickly take a look at some quick-fire facts about today's true crime location. For any beer fans out there, there is a Carlsberg Brewery in Northampton. It was opened in 1974 and was the first brewery opened by the Danish company outside of Denmark. Now, I use the term beer fan lightly there because personally I don't like the stuff, but it gives itself the tagline of probably the best beer in the world, which is some claim, especially if, like me, you don't really like it. I mean, if Carlsberg want to sponsor me and throw me some free beer, I'll take it, but that's just my personal opinion. The town played host to England's last ever witch executions in 1705 when Eleanor Shaw and Mary Phillips were burned to death, I assume at the stake. Northampton claims to have hosted England's only recorded case of someone being pressed to death. Not sure what that hand motion was, but that's also known as crushing. So basically this is an old execution method in which the recipient would have stones placed on their chest until they confessed to the crime they were being accused of. Should they fail to confess, more stones would be added until eventually they just died. I don't think any form of execution would be a walk in the park, but that one, as with many medieval methods, is particularly horrifying. The biggest market square in England was established in Northampton in 1189 around All Saints Church. UK comedian Alan Carr spent most of his childhood growing up in Northampton. His dad was even a footballer for The Cobblers back in the late 80s. British comedian and TV presenter Des O'Connor was evacuated to Northampton during the Second World War and worked in a shoe factory there. He also played football for the Cobblers as a schoolboy and a reserve team player. And actor Rowan Atkinson, star of Black Adder and Mr Bean, has also lived in Northampton. But that's enough about Northampton for now. There were plenty more facts I could have shared with you, but I shan't waffle on any longer. I'm going to get into the story now, but before I do, I feel it's only fair for me to warn you that there will be graphic descriptions of violence against both children and animals in this episode. So please consider this your official warning. I'd firstly like to introduce you to the villain of this episode. His name is Philip Austin. 
Uh, that's Philip with two L's, by the way. And he was born in 1969. Let me just state here that this isn't one of those stories where there's a shitload of information available regarding Philip's childhood and young adult years. This is one of those random, one-off cases whereby the suspect has no real history of violence or criminal activity. I'm not going to make any assumptions that his childhood was perfectly uneventful, but based on my research, nothing jumps out to contradict that theory. The earliest piece of information I could find about Philip was that he and his partner Claire met in 1991. They met in a pub after Philip made the first move by buying Claire a rose. That's such a sign of the times having a rose seller in the pub. It's always so awkward at restaurants when they come round asking for a few quid for a little rose. Maybe that's just me being thrifty. Or a tight arse, as we say in the UK. The couple soon started a relationship and Claire became pregnant after only a few months of meeting Philip. Straight away, there are a few things to consider here. Realistically, the couple barely knew each other. Even so, within a few months, they were already bound together with regards to their unborn child. Philip then did what perhaps he considered to be the honourable thing and he proposed to Claire. Claire accepted and the two were bound together even stronger at that point. What I'm getting at here is that not only did Philip not really know Claire, more importantly, Claire didn't really know Philip. That point will soon become clear as this story unfolds. Their first child, Kieran, was born and followed quickly by the birth of their second child, a daughter whom they named Jade. The couple, having already moved to Northampton in 1992, tied the knot in the summer of 1993, three months after the birth of baby Jade. I managed to take a look at the couple's wedding video and I must say, Philip doesn't seem like much of a people person. There's a really awkward scene where he's asked to make a speech and it's just unbearable. It takes him a good few minutes just to pluck up the courage to stand up, never mind start talking, and he stands there patiently waiting for the background murmuring to stop before he says all but three or four sentences and sits back down. Now there's no issue with people having low confidence, that's fine, but it's a key insight into how the marriage and its ultimate demise would come into play. Philip disowned his entire family right before he married Claire, and he had no friends either. His own best man wasn't even his mate, it was one of Claire's. Imagine that, your own best man isn't even one of your men. Philip made a living as a night shift forklift truck driver, that's a mouthful, and Claire was an auxiliary nurse at the time of their marriage, but she later went on to work for Northamptonshire County Council as a part-time home help. They appear to have had a very typical British family life for the next seven years after the marriage, from the outside anyway. Behind closed doors, Philip showed a much darker side to his personality that appears to have been reserved for Claire. He would verbally put her down, comment on her weight, purchase lavish items when the family was struggling financially, such as golf clubs when he didn't even golf, or he'd go out and buy an expensive watch or something like that. He would even leave the house with a packed bag for a few days after he and Claire had, had an argument, feeling that he would be showing Claire that he was needed at the house. That's some extreme lengths he went to, all to regain some form of control. We're getting a little bit of an insight into his character now. We do need to jump forward to the year 2000, which is seven years after they were married. That's where the start of this story takes place. Kieran at this point was your typical eight-year-old boy. He ate constantly, as they tend to do, and he had a crew cut. I was a similar age to Kieran in 2000. I'll have been approaching my 11th birthday that July. For the record, my haircut was a number two all over. I also had a legitimate afro when I was around 15, and I still have the hair kept somewhere in a jar, but that's a story for another day. Jade was seven with long blonde hair. They say watch out for the quiet ones, don't they? Well, Jade was a quiet kid, but she had a real cheeky and mischievous side to her personality, something I massively relate to with my own daughter. Like most little girls, Jade loved jewellery, she would always raid her grandmother's jewellery box as mine does with her grandma. Kieran, ever the protective older brother, albeit only by a year, always looked after his baby sister and looked out for her. The family of four also had two pet dogs named Dandy and Sooty. My guess is that Dandy was named after The Dandy, which was a famous British children's comic magazine, and Sooty was likely named after the glove puppet Sooty from children's TV show Sooty and Sweep. If you're outside of the UK, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but anyone that's from here, you can probably relate. I mean, that is only a guess from me that that's what the dogs are named after, but it's a logical guess. 
The dogs were poodles, if you're interested in their breed. It's irrelevant to the story, but I didn't want to leave any dog lovers hanging. So far, it sounds like a pretty idyllic situation, right? Marriage, two kids, two dogs. It's many people's dream. Philip, however, was becoming more and more frustrated at the power shift that was happening at home. His days of insulting Claire for her weight seemed to be over. She once won Slimmer of the Month at her diet class, whilst Philip in the meantime was heavier than ever. Claire also had recently acquired her driving license. No longer would she need to rely on Philip for lifts here, there and everywhere. She was becoming more independent, and Philip didn't like it. The whole family went on holiday with some friends to the Canary Islands located 100 miles west off the coast of Morocco, Northern Africa. This was in June of 2000. As with most big occasions and holidays back then, a handheld camera was taken and filmed the entire holiday. Looking at the footage, Philip seemed happy enough, as did Claire and the kids, but one of the family friends that went with them, he noted seeing a different side to Philip that he'd never seen before. He remembers Philip constantly asking why they were there, why they booked the holiday, what the point of it was, and so on. Philip even squared up to the family friend and the pair nearly had a fight over nothing. Basically, Philip was at breaking point after suppressing his rage for so many years. It was finally starting to bubble over. Back in Northampton, our story continues the following month in July of 2000. Now this was a heavy hitting month for the UK already, even before the events of this story unfolded. On July 1st, 2000, an eight-year-old girl named Sarah Payne disappeared from near her family home in the civil parish of Kingston Gorse in West Sussex, which is in South East England. She had been abducted by a man named Roy Whiting, and it is suspected that she was either strangled, suffocated, or perhaps both. Her body was found on July 17th, 2000, in a field around 12 miles away from where she had been abducted. It was a huge case with massive coverage throughout the UK. The reason I mention this is that on July 17th, when the news broadcast that Sarah's body had been found, Carol Quinn, who is Claire's mother, was watching it on TV. While she was ironing, she thought about how devastated she would be if that had either been Kieran or Jade's body they'd found. Carol didn't know it, but she would sadly soon find out how it felt. That same afternoon, she received a phone call. It was the school secretary. She called to let Carol know that neither Kieran nor Jade had been to school all week, which was not only extremely out of character for them, but it wasn't something Claire would have kept from her mum either if it had been intentional. As a parent, you get this weird feeling when something isn't quite right. Carol quickly realised that she hadn't heard from Claire all week and now the kids were revealed to not have been to school, she felt in her gut that something really terrible had happened. Harry, Carol's husband, drove with her to Stockmead Road. Harry entered the property first, but he soon came back out only a few moments later. What he had seen was enough to make him do a full 180. He walked right up to Carol and told her not to go in the house because Claire had done something awful to herself. The ever defiant Carol replied by saying, no she hasn't, and went against her husband's advice by walking straight through the open door. I'm going to be a real tease now and not reveal just yet as to what Carol saw when she entered the Austins family home. I'm instead going to do what all good crime dramas do. Picture if you will a blank screen with some white text in the middle that reads one week earlier. I could have simply put that blank screen with the relevant text on here, the YouTube video, but that would have meant my audio only listeners missed out. July 10th, 2000. It was a Monday morning. Philip wasn't long home from his night shift and Claire had gotten the kids ready for their first day of the school week. Philip took Kieran and Jade to school, waved them off, and instead of returning home to get sleep as he usually would, he stopped at a few different places instead. First, he stopped off for a Mackey's breakfast. Mackey's is slang for McDonald's, if you were wondering. I prefer a Greg's Bacon Sarnie over a Mackey's breakfast myself, but each to their own. He also bought a couple of things which he planned to read while he ate his morning meal. He bought Auto Trader magazine, which is a British magazine with classified car ads, and he also bought a newspaper. He flicks through the Auto Trader magazine and he circled a few different car ads. He was already likely planning his escape at this point from what was to come. After he finished his bacon egg McMuffin wheel with an extra hash brown, he left the fast food outlet and headed for an exotic massage parlour. By the way, the bacon egg McMuffin comment was merely an assumption as to what he ordered. 
I also say exotic massage parlour because it was basically a front for a brothel. For the first time in his life, Philip engaged in paid sexual intercourse with a sex worker. He then visited a local hardware store and purchased a rubber mallet. He later went on to explain that he bought the mallet to complete some garden work that needed doing, though there was nothing wrong with the Austin family's garden and a rubber mallet would have been of no use in that regard. After a busy morning, Philip returned home just after 1pm. Bear in mind that the following chain of events is based on what Philip told police officers. Sadly, as you'll soon see, Claire's version of events would never see the light of day. Philip claims that Claire was upstairs when he arrived back home. After asking where he'd been, remember he usually returned straight home after dropping the kids off, the two got into an argument centred around booking another holiday. I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but it's quite common in the UK for families to book another holiday as soon as they return from the one they've just been on. Often, it's at the same hotel and on the same dates, only taking place the following year. So, they're arguing upstairs about booking a holiday, and Philip swings at Claire with his new mallet, catching her on the arm. A melee then takes place, which occurs all over the house. Philip grabs Claire by the neck a few times, but she kept getting away. He was trying to throttle her. They fought upstairs on the landing, down the stairs, in the downstairs toilet, and Claire even opened the front door and tried to escape, but Philip soon slammed it back shut. The fight ended when Claire either fell or was tripped by Philip, it's not clear which one, and she ended up on the floor downstairs. Philip then proceeded to strangle her whilst violently banging her head repeatedly on the floor. Once she passed out, Philip went and retrieved the mallet and struck Claire on the head, before then retrieving two knives from the kitchen. He stabbed Claire in the chest with such force that one of the handles broke off. So then he went and got the second knife and stabbed her with that before returning to strangulation, this time using one of Claire's bras, which he again had gone away to retrieve, this time from the wash basket or laundry basket. Now that's a brutal way to go, especially when the one doing it is your husband and father to your two kids. I think it's crucial here to note that this attack was both premeditated and calculated. Think about it. He specifically purchased a mallet which he ended up using on Claire. He must also have dropped it during the melee at some point and took the time to calmly go and get it before carrying on with his deadly assault. Once he had finished attacking Claire, he next took his anger out on Dandy and Sutte, the family's poodles. He battered them to death with the mallet, leaving both of their skulls crushed. The worst is yet to come, I'm afraid. Philip, now covered in the blood of his wife and dogs, changed his clothes and set off towards Standon's Barn Lower School for the end of school run. Typically this is in the afternoon, around three-ish, half past three. Once he collected Kieran and Jade from school, he explained how he was going to treat them to a chippy tea, by which I mean fish and chips. This was a Monday, remember. Now I say that because Friday is the sort of unofficial day to have a chippy tea in the UK. The kids must have been so pleased, bless them. When they returned home, Philip drugged both of the kids with Nitol. If you haven't heard of Nitol, it's a very popular liquid sleeping aid in the UK. It's basically liquid sleeping pills. It's completely legal, by the way, and it's available to purchase over the counter. Once the kids were sedated, Philip strangled them both to death one by one. He first strangled Kieran in his own bed using a pair of toddler reins. He then went across to Jade's room and used the cord from his dressing gown to strangle her. With the exception of the family cat, Snoopy, the entire Austin family had been wiped out by its head. Time to imagine a blank screen again. Only this time it says one week later. We're back to July 17th, 2000 now for clarity. Remember how Carol had walked through the front door after her husband Harry had told her not to? Well, she was greeted by the sight of her daughter's lifeless body surrounded by a pool of blood and one of the two poodles. She immediately made her way upstairs after panicking about the safety of her only grandkids. She was horrified to find Kieran lying face down on his own bed and Jade lying face up on the floor of her bedroom with one leg propped up against the wall. Apparently Jade's mouth was open as if she had been mid-scream when she took her final breath. Imagine her terror, seeing her own father killing her. And imagine the terror Carol must have felt seeing that final image on her granddaughter's face. 
The whole situation doesn't even compute. I can't imagine how Carol felt that day. And every single day after, I imagine. Though, one thing did confuse me. Claire's body was found in the hallway by the front door as soon as Carol walked through the door. But Philip brought the kids home after he killed Claire, so I'm sort of left scratching my head as to how they didn't see their mum's body. I suppose Claire could have been further in the house than I thought, or perhaps Philip took them both upstairs straight away. I guess only Philip knows. When Carol found the bodies of her daughter, grandkids and their dogs, she noted that the stench was unbearable. That was because the bodies had been left there for a week. I had a look at some statistics on the NSPCC's website and some of the following data is truly shocking. A 2020 briefing from the NSPCC stated that in the last five years, there was an average of 62 child deaths by assault or undetermined intent a year in the UK. On average, at least one child is killed a week in the UK. Children under the age of one are the most likely aid group to be killed by another person, followed by 16 to 24 year olds. Kids under the age of one are the most likely to be killed by someone. That is frightening. Child homicides are most commonly caused by the child's parent or step-parent, whilst adolescent homicides are most commonly caused by a stranger, a friend or an acquaintance. There's a number of different sources of data on child deaths, which all provide different insights into the number of deaths by abuse or neglect. And finally, 31% of all child homicides are committed by their parent or step-parent. Unbelievable. Some people just shouldn't have kids. They do say that most murders are committed by someone you know, but your own family? That's so dark. Philip had seemingly disappeared after killing his entire family. He spent time in both Blackpool and Scarborough, which are popular seaside towns on England's northwest and northeast coast, respectively. He was eventually tracked down and found in the Lake District, a national park in northwest England. He was sat in his car, passed out, having slashed his own wrists. He didn't manage to end his own life, though, as he most probably had intended to. He was instead arrested and taken in for questioning. The murder investigation was led by Detective Superintendent Chris Cross. I know it's not funny, but Chris Cross, come on, you can't make this up, can you? Of Northamptonshire Police. He made the following statement. There is no doubt that Claire and Philip had their share of problems. Both confided in friends and they had financial and relationship problems. Claire also confided in a number of her close friends that Philip was short-tempered with the children and would often use physical punishment when they misbehaved, more so in relation to Kieran than Jade. During questioning, Philip was asked why he attacked Claire. His reply was a rather nonchalant one. He said, She started hassling me and arguing and that I just turned on her. When asked the same question but in relation to his kids, Philip said, It sort of came to me that I'd killed her, so I went upstairs and killed my children. It's ridiculously cold to complete a full family wipeout, but to speak about what you've done so coldly takes it to a next level. Philip appeared at Northampton Crown Court on July 24, 2000, and at first pleaded not guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility, that old chestnut. He did eventually change his plea to guilty, though, on March 22, 2001. Sentencing judge Mr Justice Potts handed him a life sentence with a minimum term to serve of 20 years in prison. Judge Potts said in his closing statement, I cannot find the words to describe this case. It is beyond the bounds of belief. Now, you might have noticed that 20 years has passed since Philip's sentencing. He became eligible for parole on March 21st, 2021, this year, and his case was referred to the parole board with his hearing taking place on April 9th. He was denied parole, but was actually recommended for a transfer to an open prison. Open prisons or Category D prisons have much lower security than closed prisons or Category A, B and C prisons. Open prisons are intended for low-risk or lower-risk prisoners who present less of a risk than the high-risk prisoners or medium-risk, I guess, and they're considered more trustworthy. In an open prison, Philip would be able to apply for a release on temporary licence, which would allow him to conduct work in the local community or to go on home leave. Carol, understandably outraged at this recommendation, publicly stated her disdain for the UK prison system and its sentencing structure. 
making reference to the family she has lost, she said, The sentencing makes me believe that they think their lives were worthless. As the sentences run concurrently, it makes it one life sentence, so he hasn't been given a life sentence at all. He's been given a tariff or 20 years. That works out as four years per life if you include the dogs. Carol launched a petition to ensure that a life sentence truly means life in prison. It has a target of 10,000 signatures, but it needs 100,000 signatures in order for it to be considered by the UK Parliament. At the time of writing this, the petition has 7,966 signatures. I've linked the petition in the show notes if you're interested in signing it. Philip has said himself that he isn't looking to be released, though he would prefer to have more freedom and less supervision than he is currently getting, which is what a transfer to an open prison would mean for him. In recommendations such as this, the Secretary of State must approve and finalise the decision before it goes ahead. The Secretaries of State are senior ministers of the Crown in the UK government. They ultimately rejected the decision for Philip to be moved to an open prison, so he'll be staying where he is. A spokesperson for the Ministry of Justice said, Upon careful consideration of all the evidence, including the parole board recommendation, the Lord Chancellor has decided not to move Philip Austin to open conditions. I think it's safe to say that was a wise decision. And there you go, that was the story of British murderer Philip Austin. Third episode done for season three, another video done. Hope you're enjoying the I'm so paranoid about people enjoying the video format, it's ridiculous. But a big shout out for this episode and the research goes out to TV series Killer in the Family, as it provided me with some great insight and detail into sort of Philip's background and his character and some of the triggers which could have potentially been seen which led to him committing these crimes if you'd like more on british murders please feel free to check me out on social media and youtube if you're listening to this on audio my link tree is in the description and that's got everything on there it's got my merchandise which you can buy at teespring links for patreon and buy me a coffee and for all the socials twitter facebook instagram tiktok they're all in my link tree which is in the description and on all of my social media channels as well. Any funds received go towards the production and research of the show and it's greatly appreciated. If you want to send me any case suggestions or get in touch, send me a DM on social media or email britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com. If you want to review the show, that would be greatly appreciated. Do that on iTunes or Podchaser. They're the two big ones. But yeah, that's another episode. And as always, for now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.